You're listening to the Men in Blazers Media Network, Suboptimal Radio. If people would just give women's football a chance, they would realize that there's a whole heck of a lot of good people in this sport who just genuinely want to make the sport a better place to be as a female because that's still a fight that's that so many people are fighting every single day and sport is such a great mechanism for change and so for us to have this platform i feel incredibly grateful it's rog with a special episode of the women's game a reminder that the mighty nwsl will return in march available where on paramount plus but today We've got a conversation that I think is really important to bring to you. One that I've looked forward to recording ever since news broke two weeks ago that the Canadian women's national team was striking for equal pay. An act of courage in a truly complex situation. A situation that became immediately ever more difficult. And I honestly still can't believe this when the governing body for football above the 49th parallel, that would be Canada Soccer, threatened to sue their own team, threatened to sue their own players, their Olympic gold medal winning players for, quote, breach of contract if they didn't take the field at the She Believes Cup. And I've got to be honest, don't know about you, but watching the Canadian women take the field at this tournament under those circumstances... Those were painful images to witness. I couldn't imagine what they were experiencing as they took the field in those purple protest jerseys with enough is enough written on the front. And to unpack it all, I'm genuinely thrilled to have a player I've long admired for the way she carries herself on and off the field. From a time at Sky Blue FC to the Sky Blue of Manchester, all the way to those glorious NWSL championship winning Portland Thorns. A creative, technically gifted goal scorer whose versatility makes her a coach's dream. Fresh off her 101st international cap, it's that gold medal winning, Twitter troll owning, best Canadian export since Tim Hortons, from your Portland Thorns and the Canadian women's national team, it's Janine Becky. Hey, Raj. I'm so happy to be here. I am delighted to see you. I've honestly long wanted to have you on. And despite the circumstances, it's a joy to see you. Ginny, let's talk about you first, because your family is Canadian. Your three older siblings were born in Saskatchewan. You're the outlier, I believe. Your parents moved to the US <laughs> shortly before you came on the scene. You were born and raised in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, right? Mal Swanson, yep. Lindsay Haran country. <laughs> Yep, yep. Uh, Mal Swanson, Lindsay Horan. Lindsay played for the dark side in Colorado, but we, we won't get into that. But uh, yeah, me and Mal played for the same club. She's quite a few years younger than me, but yeah, born and raised in Colorado. That is a region that produces more U.S. national team standouts than almost anywhere else in the country. And I know that you participated in U.S. youth camps with, well, so many of my co-hosts, Andy Sullivan, Midge Purse, also Mighty Rose Lavelle. But ultimately, you decided to play for Canada. Our loss. But take us back to that choice, because without it, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. What was that decision like? What was the deciding factor for you? Take us there. I mean, a few things. Uh, First, I'll say best decision that I've ever made. I think that's pretty clear. Um, To have played for Canada has been like the joy of my career. But yeah, it was back in just before the under 20 cycle, under 20 World Cup, really. And I was playing for the US and things just weren't really clicking for me. And as everybody knows, the player pool in the US is just massive. I understood that I was on the cusp of not getting my break in the U20 World Cup and got a phone call from uh, Andrew Olivieri, who was the Canadian coach at the time, the Canadian under 20 coach, and said, you know, we've been tracking you for a while. We understand that um, you can play for Canada. Have you ever thought about it? And I was like, genuinely, no. Um, But like, I'm down. I'm I'm in, I'm interested. So he's like, come into camp, no strings attached. You can go back if you don't like it, um, but just come and like give us a chance. That is fate. That's how it was sealed, as they say in Canada. The constellations revealed themselves one star at a time. And before we get into the immense challenge of the present day, we're chatting now as you 
have just passed the incredible 100 cap mark for your country. 101 caps with a Canadian team that has come so far in the past decade, edging closer and closer ever to glory before finally winning gold at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Jenny, standing up there, listening to the Canadian national anthem as the flag was raised, gold medal around your neck after so many years of striving, so many almost. Take us to that moment. What did it feel like? What did that moment mean to you? It's so weird to answer that question. We were just talking about this actually at Shea Believes with some of the, the players. And it's like you dream about that moment your whole life. You see other other athletes take the podium and you think what the heck could be going through their mind. You know, there's emotion, all that kind of stuff. And you never genuinely know how you're going to feel. You could never guess how you're going to feel. And I think for me, it was like this combination of all these different emotions, like incredible gratitude and happiness. And like, we finally, you know, we're here, but there was also this kind of conflicting emotion of like, just this incredible motivation to do more. And like, we've, you know, we've, conquered this mountain let's you know go win the effing world cup and it was just kind of this funny thing where you're like whoa okay like come back here you just won the olympics like take a step back um but yeah i mean you hear you hear the anthem play you kind of realize like man i didn't know if this moment would ever happen for me you know i think i've said it so many times before and i'll continue to say it i still don't think our team gets the respect that we deserve as world champions and um you know that's a global kind of respect and we've seen it come more and more as we've been more successful but i just don't know what it is about our team that we can't seem to like break that barrier of like really truly being considered one of the best teams in the world you know i i think about the dual bookends of those experiences janine you guys on the podium that gold medal around your neck. Let's go and win that World Cup. Nothing can stop us now. You know, the fight for respect and where we are now. Football is about joy. Football is about challenge. Football is about light. Football is about darkness. And you are experiencing both of those emotions. They're the really the, the great contrasting emotions of life. It's not just a fight for respect from your opponents. You're almost embroiled in a much more primal fight for respect one from your own federation. And this equal pay fight, just making the headlines now, but I know that it's been simmering under the surface for a while. You and your teammates have been grappling with Canadian soccer's governing body, who it's been reported spend $11 million on the entirety of their men's program from the top elite first 11 through the youth levels and just $5.1 million on their women's program. Demanding equal pay, equal treatment and equal working conditions to the Canadian men's national team. Thinking back to the origins of this battle, when did it really kick off in your mind? We've been having conversations with them over, you know, the last year or so, maybe a little bit before then. And we've been a union for some time now, a organized association, a recognized association, and have been negotiating with Canada Soccer for years. Um, And that's always been the case. There's always been at least since I've been on the team, a CBA on the table. (laughs) That's the contents of that CBA were not ideal whatsoever. The CBA being the collective bargaining agreement. Yes, yes, correct. Um, And so just over the last couple of years, we've, you know, started to say this could be better. We saw the U.S. team, you know, fight their fight. And what's just interesting about the Canadian Soccer Association is that you know, our men's team has just found, you know, the light of success in the last year. And to have seen them kind of make their way to the world stage and and compete in qualifying and and win qualifying um, has kind of shown the association a new, okay, like here we have two teams who are successful on the global stage. We have a men's team that's going to go to the World Cup. Kings of CONCACAF. Yeah, Kings of CONCACAF. Thank you. It's almost like it was a surprise to them. Um, And... You know, I really, truly feel for our men's team in that respect because they, you know, they had to deal with with that. Um, But at the same time, they continued to, you know, defy odds and get there. And it's been really cool to kind of speak to them through this whole process and just kind of see where they're coming from. And I've been a player rep for... Oh gosh, I don't even know yet now. Oh, two years, a little over two years. Um, and the the men's team has, you know, player reps as well and guys that tend to, you know, do the communication with the association. Um, and 
when we've negotiated with Canada Soccer, it's kind of just always been an expectation that we just speak to the guys, whether that be through a Zoom call or a group text. You know, we have a couple of different group texts with with them and just kind of sharing information and um, sharing circumstance. And here's what we did for this. And this is what they gave us. And so now us as a women's team, we're starting to get an idea of what the association can actually afford and like what they're paying the men to play in these qualifying games. And it's just like, we never were asking for these things before because we genuinely didn't know that it was possible. And we've been for the last 10, 12 years, a long time since I've been on the team, negotiating in the dark in a lot of ways on these topics of, we don't actually know what we should be asking for. And so I have to credit you know the men's team for kind of shining a light on on this whole thing and really genuinely holding themselves to such a high standard when they started to perform of like we you know we deserve to be compensated like our counterparts around the world so essentially the men and the women canadian national teams that the streams have been crossed and that information has given you an advantage in terms of your own understanding and what you are getting and what you're not getting and the sense that over time the situation is actually devolving canada soccer withholding financial compensation for 2022 announcing further budget cuts for the women's program right on the eve of the she believes tournament this past month there's talk bubbling up of a private donor actually had to step in to fund training camps back in November. Over the course of these months leading into the She Believes tournament, you fighting for what you need, things actually getting worse rather than better. Can you describe what's happening behind the scenes with your team and how that feels? It's, you know, feeling incredibly proud and having a lot of pride for playing for Canada and wearing that crest and wearing the colours and representing my my country and then at the same time taking a step back sometimes and being like wow like questioning is this fight worth it and the answer is always yes but you have those questions spiraling around in your mind thinking you know why is it that we have to deal with this and then i think there are teams and women and situations so much worse than ours and like this is where we are so i can't even imagine where other federations are and other women's teams that don't even have a place to start because they don't even know how to start and my hope in all of this is just like the us team was you know uh, an inspiration to us in our fight that we can be an inspiration to other federations because our fight is a little bit different you know we are talking about equal pay and that is 100% a priority for us but more so we're talking about equal opportunity equal treatment and that's not just for us it's for our youth teams it's for the youth men's teams it's for the youth women's teams who have now come to a place where they're getting one camp this year and it's like what are we doing for our youth how are we preparing these players to step onto the international stage and feel confident playing against their you know their england counterparts or their brazil counterparts where they know that those players are either one in with their national teams all the time or playing in professional environments when they're 14 years old and playing in academies since they're, you know, like five, six, seven years old. Um, And then you have, you know, incredible players on the world stage at 18, 19 who are just absolutely blowing people out of the water. And you take somebody like Alfonso Davies, who is a perfect example of that. And look how successful he's been because he had the right situation, you know, growing up. And he, you know, he made the most of, um, his environments. But the the truth is there's not that opportunity for the Canadian youth. And what's going to happen is we've been incredibly blessed with talent in this country. And I'll speak just on the women's side. You know, you see somebody like Christine Sinclair, who is the best in the world and has had a significantly long national team career. And I think Christine's a little bit of an anomaly because she's so good and she takes such good care of herself that she could literally play for as long as she wanted to and and it would be fine. But players on our team have incredibly long national team careers. You don't see that across the world. You see players play for, you know, since they make their debut at 20, they're done by, you know, 28, 30 because there's other players coming in that kick them out because they're good. But we don't have that. And so, I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm like, great, (laughs) I have a long national team career. But I also look at the players behind me and we get, you know, great talent here or there, but it's not this consistent flow of players coming in. You're fighting for not just yourselves, you're fighting for the future and to have Canadian national teams where the average age is not Tim Ream. 
But you know, I'm fascinated by something you've said, that you're also fighting as an example for other nations around the world. Just as the US women's fight for equality, the collective bargaining agreement that leveled everything from match appearance and performance fees to fields, hotels, staffing for the United States team. Can you talk about the knock-on effect that that created in the Canadian locker room? Your United States, the great rivals, but you guys... Sounds like you were looking at them being like that, that we find so deeply inspiration. We got to pursue it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Megan Rapinoe had posted something on her Instagram prior to the She Believes saying something like bitter, bitter rivals on the field, but like big allies off. And that's totally it. Like we step on the field and and it's two teams that genuinely hate losing to one another. Um, and it's just become this like passionate it's like my favorite game to play in every time we play them. But then, you know, we step off the field and here's a group of people who have inspired not just our team, but the whole world. And you look at them individually and you see all these different voices for all these different reasons. And each person has their own, you know, extended group of people that they inspire. Um, and they're just all such different personalities. And I just think it was so so incredibly cool how they came together and had you know this common goal of we're not going to settle for anything less and they were in it like they were in the fight for the long haul and so when i look at our team and i sit in a room with our team and you feel that same energy it's like we're a powerful powerful group of people and to have seen what they were able to do and to see how they collaborated with their men's team. And they found genuinely good people on the men's side that said, you know what, you do deserve to, to be on the same level as us because this is the same game. We are doing the same things. <laughs> you mentioned it earlier, like it's infuriating to deal with the Twitter, Twitter trolls across the world that are just like, you don't deserve to be paid the same amount of money. And it's like, Hey, you can't fight them all, right? Like you spend your entire life trying to fight off the Twitter trolls and you never win. And the thing that bothers me the most is like, I said this and I like really have to bite my tongue sometimes. And sometimes I make the mistake of trying to fight the Twitter trolls. And then I find myself like, why do I do that? And I have now learned my lesson. But the point of like, when you bring in more revenue, you can, or the most revenue, whatever, you can get paid. They're missing the point of the fight. The fight is equal treatment, equal opportunity, and equal pay. And I think that my main takeaway from all this is for people to understand we're not asking to be paid millions and millions of dollars from sponsors or ticket sales that we don't have. We're just being asked to be treated in the same way as our men's team, in the same way as they were to prepare for their World Cup, and for our youth to be taken care of in a way that the Federation is very much capable of taking care of them. Janine, Becky, if this is the only thing you take away from our conversation today, I like to shut my eyes and imagine with these trolls that you're just dealing with a thousand Russian wannabe Piers Morgans. And so your fight against them is one that oh, your time is better used elsewhere. But take us inside that locker room when the news of budget cuts first come through. What goes through your mind? And as a veteran player on the team and one of the most outspoken voices, what did you tell your teammates? Who's leading that conversation? Can you give us a sense? Yeah, so when when the news kind of broke to us, we were actually not even in camp yet. So that was, I think, the most difficult part of all of it. And trying to get 25, 30 people on a Zoom call on short notice all around the world is probably one of the most impossible tasks that you'll ever be tasked with. Um, so we kind of called an emergency team call. I think we probably had you know three-fourths of our team on that call, and it's myself, Quinn, Sophie Schmidt, and Christine Sinclair, who are our current player representatives for our association. And so we're in pretty constant communication about things. We've got a group text. We tend to jump on the phone. I'm obviously here in Portland with Sync. Um, so we have conversations all the time about things. And so I was the one that you know took the lead on that conversation and just said, look, everyone, this is extremely unideal, uh, but here's the situation. Here's what we can expect when we go into camp. And look like it's going to be it's going to be rough but we have to decide what we want to do as a team and so at that point it was like we're all going to get to she believes we're going to sit down in the same room when we haven't been together in months uh and just you know like figure this out talk this out so you know we arrived in camp and you know we're immediately seeing the changes we had we had less days of camp we had less staff around um you know we were staying 
in the middle of nowhere Orlando. And apparently that had to do with the fact that there was like a cheer competition in town. So maybe that didn't actually, wasn't that actually an effect of the budget cuts, but it sure did feel like it. Um, and so I find it kind of coincidental that even though there was this massive cheer competition, we're like, it just was very poetic. I'm like, here we are. This just feels very like not the same. Second to the cheerleaders. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I mean, I can't do flips in the air. I can't do any of that. So, I mean, put my hands up to them. But um, I have to credit our, our incredible staff. They were just fantastic. Just like we're going to sit in the background. We understand, you know, whatever you guys want to do. We're, we're on board. We support you. Um, and that was just like a really incredible feeling to feel that it wasn't just our group of players, but it was the extended group that was there that was just ready for whatever was going to come next. Um, and so, I mean, I know that none of us have ever been in that position where we're like, what do we do? Um, and we are just like, we have to make a stand. And we've for so long given the CSA the benefit of the doubt, like, OK, we're going to do this in good faith. We're going to we're going to hold off on whatever it is we want to do to give you the chance to make things right. And we've done that time and time and time again. And every time we've been disappointed um, and let down. And I think everyone was just genuinely so, to put it in a nice way, sick and tired of doing that. And so we were like, we're going to, we're going to do something we've never done. And we decided we weren't going to show up to training and it really took off. And I don't know if we really, really expected um, what was to come next, but what we wanted to happen happened, which was we wanted the conversation to start. So when you make that decision and just start that snowballing fight, public fight for change, how does your life flip? And I know from speaking to Becky Sauerbrunn, often during the fight for equality in the United States. It is it is astonishing how much time she and the leadership over here, yes, they trained, yes, they played football matches, yes, they represented their nation, but the number of conference calls they were on, the number of memos, the number of briefings from lawyers, you are an elite competitor. And I know from following your career, you're also a fighter in your heart, but this is like running a startup on the side of trying to be an elite international footballer. Yeah, uh, an elite startup that you have no experience in or knowledge of like where to go next. So it was it was challenging. But like I said, I have incredible people around me. You know, Christine, Sophie and Quinn are all incredible minds who have very, very strong ideas and are fighters just like me. And when you put the four of us together with the team that we have behind us and a group of players that are essentially fighting in the dark because there are certain things that we can't tell them. And I can't imagine how that feels as a teammate where you're like, we've given these four players the trust and respect and, and power to kind of make decisions on our behalf. And we're just like fully trusting them with that decision. And that feels so empowering as a teammate um, to know that we have these 23, 24 people sitting in a room just being like, yep, you got it. And just giving us their full trust. And just the way that our team was throughout this entire process and continues to be is very, very admirable. And we definitely wouldn't be able to do this work if it wasn't for them trusting us um, with with these conversations. There, there was the 23 squad members behind you. And then the men came out quickly, put out a statement of solidarity alongside you. They'd had their own fight. They would actually did go on strike for a friendly ahead of their World Cup. But when Canada Soccer threatened to sue you, how did you find out? What did that feel like? Take us that. Well, we found out through our lawyers. I don't think any of us sitting there were like surprised they took that step based on the circumstance and based on the fact that they really needed us to play those games. Um, but like as a player, it's just kind of like, so you're going to sue us for a bunch of money that you don't pay us. Like we can't be in that position as humans and like us four sitting in that situation, there's players that were in their first camp in She Believes and we're like, what is going through your mind? Are you ever going to come back to this place? And the four of us sitting there are like, we could never put our teammates in this situation where they're facing individual lawsuits because of this whole thing. We knew we had to move move pretty quickly um, and get the team together and say, look, you guys, this is the situation. And, you know, we can go back to training and we can legally do 
what we're expected to do. Um, but you know, the rest is, the rest is up to us how we do it. And so it was from there that we kind of decided what kind of action do we want to take and what do we want to do to keep this conversation going? Because the last thing we wanted to do was let the conversation die. With no choice but to play, your captain, Christine Sinclair, legend, tweeted, we will continue to fight for everything we deserve and we will win. The She Believes Cup will be played in protest. And on February 16th, you took the field for the first of the She Believes Cup games against the US Women's National Team. What did that feel like, knowing that you'd essentially been bullied into playing? I can honestly say I didn't think about tactics like one time <laughs> that week. So we're stepping on the field against the best team in the world. And I'm like, hope I remember the game plan. Um, but I think it was just, we went into that game with with genuine, like like no expectations of the actual game, but just understanding that there, this was going to be a massive moment in time for us. And I had been in pretty constant communication with Becky that week. Becky Sauerbrink. Yeah, around like what what we could do and how they could help us. And they were so, so supportive. I know Alex Morgan was was texting Kale and Sheridan, like, what do you guys need help with? Like, we'll do anything. And um, a couple other players that, I mean, we obviously have great relationships with these players. Like Mal and Lindsay both messaged me. Um, a lot of them were reposting our statement from the Players Association. And every time I saw something, I was just like, wow, this is so much bigger than us. And this is so much bigger than just our fight but this is again like I said all the teams around the world all women around the world that have to do this every single day um, to see a group of people who on the field have genuinely no reason to like each other but off the field coming together so strongly and Becky was like we have to do something like we have to do something that people can see and I was like 100% this is what we're doing and she's like can we wear the purple tape and I was like 100% and we actually messaged her up and she's like apparently purple tape's really hard to find and I was like don't worry we got you <laughs> and we kind of you know <laughs> spread the spread the stuff around and and they were you know more than happy to to make that a priority for them and and then we were able to do you know the coming together before kickoff which was a super super powerful moment there's two things that you mentioned that took place before the game that I want to hear a little bit of the story, the genesis. You warmed up, you and your teammates, with your training tops inside out, hiding the Canada soccer logo. And you also took the field out of the tunnel for the national anthems. A really powerful moment for everybody who was watching, wearing purple shirts that said enough is enough. Uh, across them. Can you talk about the genesis of those ideas and the execution and how that felt? Yeah. So when we were talking as four player reps about just kind of throwing out some ideas of what we wanted to do, um, Christine was the one that said purple is a global symbol for gender equality. And we were like, great, done. We'll do something with purple. And we kind of um, created a survey and, and put it out to the team and just said, write your ideas in this survey. And we got lots of responses back, like, can we do this? Can we do that? And there's obviously some like rules you have to follow, like FIFA doesn't allow you to put anything on your jersey. So like we were going to put purple tape on our jerseys and they were like, you can't do that, which is like, OK, great. We'll just put it on our wrists. What was the craziest idea that you would have liked to have done but had to reject? <laughs> <laughs> just like going on the field and just like kicking the ball out of bounds every single time you got it or just like going on the field and in a formation and just sitting down like <laughs> we talked about so many things but both of those Everton have been doing all season um they don't work they don't work what you did was so much more powerful that would have been incredible going on and just sitting yeah. down and people were like dead serious I was like this could get really interesting you know the purple shirt's uh, we were sitting in a room and we were like, kind of like, these are the shirts that are just like plain purple cotton t-shirts that we got on Amazon. <laughs> like We're like, here's what we're going to wear to walk out. And everyone's just like so on board. That was like the best thing. No one ever had any questions. Everyone's just like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, you were like, who's got the coolest handwriting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jordan Heidema was like, well, should we write something on them? And this was the night before the game. And like, like the night, like 8 p.m., I'm like 20 minutes and I'm going to bed. Uh, and Jordan was like, should we write something on them? And everyone's like, well, you know, we kind of started and she was like, well, let's just write like enough is enough. And the first thought I had was, well, like we already said that. And, and 
but that, that's just such a special thing about having a group of people with like different ideas is I wouldn't have, I didn't think of that, but she was just like so committed to that. And she's like, I'll write them for everyone. And I was like, you really want to do that? So her and Kaylin Sheridan stayed in the room for, I don't even know how long, maybe an hour and a half, two hours and wrote on every single shirt. Um, enough is enough. And they were like, we need to make sure that it like looks the same and all of this. And I'm like, I so appreciate that I have teammates like that. Um, and so yeah, total credit to Jordan and Kaylin who took the time to actually write on those shirts. And I think the outcome of that was, was really massive. And the fact that people could actually read what was being written on those shirts was, was pretty incredible. And then we said we were committed to wearing the purple until this is solved and we're still committed to that. So whatever happens next, the purple will be there. There was one more truly I mean, incredibly beautiful moment right before kickoff. All the players, both teams, Canada, the United States, as you've said, intense rivals on the field, off it, great friends. And with every single United States starter by your side, the team, put your arms around each other. Incredible statement of solidarity and walked together and just stood there in a remarkably poignant, beautiful statement and I watched and I marveled and you're actually standing by the great Becky Sauerbrunn in that moment can you tell us about that moment what what were you saying in your mind to whom and how did it feel I just I appreciate Becky so much she's I mean you know from your conversation with her anyone that follows her knows she's just an incredible person um and someone with a really really big heart uh, always always down to do things for change um, just a really big fighter. Uh, and she was always on board with anything. You know, we, we exchanged lots of messages that week, whatever you guys need, let us know where we support you. We're here for you. Um, you know, and this is your fight. You tell us what you want us to do and we're in. And just like for her to have given myself and our team, just kind of like the avenue to do that in their tournament on, in their home stadiums, um, in front of their fans on their TV. Like it was just this really big, like, wow, this is so powerful. And like, thank you for giving us this, this platform. And so when we talked about what we wanted to do pregame, that was never a question that we wanted to come together and like show, um, that we were together. And I was in between, uh, Becky and Alex, Alex was on my left. Um, and you know, I just, I looked out, I, turned to Becky and I just said, thank you so much for this. And she was like, of course, like just played it off. So nonchalant, that's Becky, like nonchalant, of course, like anytime, no problem. Like it was just no problem that they just like made this massive stand with us. And then Alex was the same. And, you know, she just made her two, she was making her 200th appearance for the U S team. And like, she was, she was ready to do this with us instead of like being in that moment for herself. Um, and I just think like whatever opinion that people have about these players, it's just so false. Like they are so for U.S. soccer, U.S. youth, uh, you know, soccer all over the world, women's teams all over the world, women empowerment. Like these are really, really powerful human beings that are choosing to be a part of our fight. And that was um, that was a really special moment and definitely something that I will hold on to. You are someone who's spoken openly about how much playing for Canada means to you as a footballer, as a human being. When that whistle goes, what happens? Are you able to compartmentalize? Because I mean, the, the team looked gassed before a ball had been kicked, mentally shattered. And Christine Sinclair admitted as much post game. She said, "We're all just exhausted." What What is it like playing under those conditions? I think as a competitor, you want to be able to compartmentalize and like just be able to play the game and play the game well. Um, and I think you know, I speak for myself when I say I was there, like I was in it. I was you know, with every kick of the ball, I was frustrated by the way that the game was going, you know, (laughs) in the first like 10 minutes of the game, I think we were just bunkered in our own 18, like trying to clear the ball. And it was just like, ah, this is how this is going to go. It's going to be one of these days. Um, And you kind of just have to weather the storm in those moments. And I think that that's kind of what that game felt like was just like, getting through it almost, you know, after the game, Bev Priestman, our our head coach brought us together and just said, you know, you're not superheroes, you're exhausted, you can't do everything. Um, And she just kind of, you know, she's, she's an incredible human being. And she's very, very much, you know, pro pro players, like, let's, you know, do what you need to do, what do you guys need? Um, But at the same time, she's also trying to prepare a team to win a World Cup. And I can't imagine the tension, you know, inside of her being, 
being a coach in these times, you know, of a federation who is not giving her what she needs to properly prepare her team. Um, And so for her to come to us in that moment and just kind of recognize that, you know, it doesn't really matter what happened in that game because what happened before that game uh, was so much bigger. And this fight is so much bigger than than playing in a, in a soccer game. And, and we would have loved to win that game. It would have been great for us. The, then had we lost that game or had we won that game, there would have been a story, right? Like they went out there and they beat the world champions amidst all of this stuff. And that would have been a great storyline. But, you know, we went out there and we were exhausted from this fight. And I think that that's more than understandable from, from everyone. You've had massive support from other women's teams around the world. We talked about the U.S. women's national team joining you in pre-match protests, linking arms around the centre circle. But the English national team, Ireland, Australian women's national teams and more all wore purple wristbands in solidarity with you in their games that week. Can you talk about what that feels like for you, that solidarity globally for you in this moment, in your fight and your teammates? It was like, it was just so, so cool. And I think I catch myself like being a fan oftentimes. Um, And sometimes, you know, like I forget that I'm like their colleague. Like where we play against each other, you're also a player. But I'm also like a massive fan and I watch these players and I'm like, wow, you are so good. Viv Mirama, I love watching her play. You know, Dabinia, I'm a massive fan of Dabinia. Um, you know, players all over the world, I love watching. You know, I have I have aspirations myself. You know, who doesn't, like, I want to be the best player, best player in the world at some point in my career. Like, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to go after that? Um, and those are, those are the things that I'm, I'm striving for in my own game. Uh, and so sometimes I have to pinch myself and remember that these are these are my colleagues and people that I'm playing against but just to you know I have lots of tons of my best friends play for you know England because I spend so much time there and so to have seen them win the Euros I was like I was like crying in front of my TV um yeah Ellie Roebuck and uh, Alex Greenwood are two of my great friends Kira Walsh Georgia Stanway you know um my my teammates from from Manchester City just to see you know them perform and win the Euros. I was like sitting in front of my TV, like, oh my God, <laughs> like, like a proud parent. So when I saw, you know, Kira reached out to me and she's just like, we want to do something. Can you, can you like tell me what's going on? So like, we know what to talk about. Like these players are genuinely interested in furthering our message. And so I had sent through, you know, to their team, some messaging and Lucy Bronze had posted something on her Instagram story and just messaged her. And I said, thank you so much for supporting us. I mean, seeing, seeing other teams wear these armbands and understanding that they're probably in fights of their own, or they have been, or they have been in these conversations with their federations at some point in time, whether that be about pay, whether that be about opportunity, opportunity, whether that be about treatment. Um, Everyone's had that conversation at some point. And maybe it happened before their time. Maybe it's happening now. Maybe it's yet to happen. Um, But to see those teams wearing the purple and to see them genuinely interested in what is going on in our fight, it reinforces that desire to continue this and to, to brave the brave the haters if you will and keep pushing through what we know that we truly deserve and what women's teams all over the world deserve and I think if people would just give women's football a chance they would realize that there's a whole heck of a lot of good people in this sport who just genuinely want to make the sport a better place and you know I'm not going to go all world peace here but like genuinely make the world a better place to be as a female, because that's still a fight that's that so many people are fighting every single day. And sport is such a great mechanism for change. Um, and so for us to have this platform, I feel incredibly grateful that, you know, I get the chance to sit here and talk to you on one of my favorite shows um, and to understand the reach that this is going to have and the reach that our fight has already had for so many um, is yeah, I, I get inspired every single day and there's certain things that, that are part of this that are really, really difficult to, to swallow. Um, but I know I speak for myself and the rest of our team when, when I say we're so, so committed to this. I just say, F the haters. It's a sign that you are doing something right and that you are also winning. That volume, it is, it is the death rattle 
please God, of uh, of the fight. Those that are trying to smother uh, and vanquish you. And talking of that, yesterday, the Canada soccer president, Nick Bontis, as you resigned, saying in a statement, Canada soccer and both of our national team programmes have the real potential to sign a historic collective bargaining agreement. I acknowledge that this moment requires change. And his resignation comes on the back of a statement put out by the Canadian women's national team earlier this month that demanded, quote, immediate change at Canada soccer. Janine, what's your reaction to this news change at the top does it feel like a watershed moment or is it just another moment in the beginning of this fight i think for me when i heard the news yesterday it was this is just one step towards change that's necessary and there's a lot that still has to be done um but i want to acknowledge that this is a step um and for any deep-rooted change there has to be change in in personnel. And this is something that as a team, we haven't explicitly called for um, and demanded, you know, people leave their positions. It's not something that we have said as a team. And so I think the recognition from him that this change is necessary is definitely a big indication that we're moving in the right direction and that the people in places of Um, influence are recognizing that this federation has not been moving in the right direction and that there needs to be to be change in in that sector. We're less than five months away from the World Cup. First of all, are you and your teammates even thinking about the World Cup or is your focus on all of the fights to come? I think we're there's there's two mindsets, right? Like we're thinking what's going to happen next because we've got a decent amount of time before the next FIFA window. Um, and then in the back of our minds, obviously, yeah, we're, we're thinking about what's going to happen in, in just a couple months time. And it's pretty crazy, like just in general to think that the world cup is this soon and very exciting. I think it's going to be a great tournament. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of questions that have been left unanswered for us. Uh, there's still a lot of conversations that need to be had and a lot of commitment that needs to be made from the Federation to give us the confidence to move forward. And I think there's been a lot of trust broken um, and that needs to be built back. And that doesn't happen with just a few, you know, we're going to fix this, we're going to fix that. There needs to be a very strong commitment from them. So what, what are the scenarios, the possibilities as you see them? The next step is what are they going to do to ensure that we show up to France in April? Um, and that's yet to be seen. There's uh, yet to be, you know, another conversation with them at this point. And, and we haven't asked for another conversation. They've not offered another conversation. So we're kind of just in a waiting place at the minute. Um, and there will be more conversations, absolutely. But there's clearly things going on behind the scenes that they are trying to sort out. And I think we wanted to give them time to do that. So, you know, I don't know what the ideal situation looks like right now. I sit here and I say, I don't know what it'll take to get me on a flight to to France in April. Um, And I'm very, very calm about that. I'm very like, you know, if it happens, then it's the right thing. And the way that all of this has unfolded has been the right way. And I try and I try my best to live my life that way. Like whatever this is, however this feels, it's for a reason. This is not just a Canadian problem. The French team currently grappling with so many complex issues of their own. Legendary captain Wendy Renard is amongst a number of players who said they will not play at this year's Women's World Cup to, quote, preserve her mental health, adding that she can no longer support the current system. So that is an option that you've all discussed as well, not participating, really the ultimate deterrent. Yeah, it's been in conversation and, you know, massive respect to Wendy and those other two players that are putting themselves first. It's very, very difficult, incredibly difficult. And I can only imagine for Wendy how that feels as as a captain, as one of the most decorated French players to ever play. To have made that decision, I can't imagine what has happened that would push her to make that decision. And, you know, I myself have had mental health struggles and I know how difficult that is and it is not an easy place to be and I will never be one to, you know, throw myself a pity party or ask for other people's empathy, but it's a difficult place to be when you, you know, offer yourself up for 
you know, comment of others and opinions of others. And that's the world that we live in. And I'm sure that in the midst of all of this for her, she has experienced a whole lot of that. And so to be strong enough to stand up and say, you know what, for my own well-being, I'm not going to participate in this pinnacle of my sport event. To say I'm not going to play in the World Cup is so monumental. I don't know if people understand the the like magnitude of that decision. You prepare for these tournaments for your entire life and you play in your first one and it's incredible. But then to continue to go and to play as many major tournaments as Wendy has and to be so close to what will be the biggest women's football tournament ever and put her hand up in February and say, I'm not going to be there because it's not the right thing for me is so incredibly sad that her passion, her life's work of preparing for this tournament, she has to say no to because it's not serving her. And that's a huge, huge red flag to everyone that there's something going on in the French Federation that needs to be looked into, needs to be solved because you can't have three of the best players in the world. The French team has incredible players. These are like top, top, top players that have been nominated for world awards and have made world teams and play on the best club teams in the world. And they're saying, I'm not going to participate in the world's biggest tournament. It is so monumental. I don't think words can, can do it justice to how big that is. Last question for you. The brilliantly thoughtful OL Reign player, Bethany Bolsa, She tweeted yesterday, it's funny how federations think they have all the power, but little do they know that players with a united front hold it all. Do you agree? 100%. I think when you see players playing for federations that do it the right way, you get really incredible outcomes and you get winners and you get fans and you get all of the good things that football has to offer but when you get federations that find some ways to misstep along the way or have you know systemic missteps um, you see the effects of that and I'm so glad in a lot of ways that we live in a world where people are starting to feel comfortable speaking up about their mental health Obviously, there's another side to it that gives other people the opportunity to have their opinions on your mental health, which I don't agree with. But for players to feel like they finally have the right and the power to speak up for themselves and say, no, I'm not going to. This is not right. I don't deserve this. She's 100 percent right. The power lies with all the players, because if there's no players, there's no federation. And if the players don't want to play, if your best players don't want to play, your federation is never going to be successful. So when a When a federation has players saying, I'm not going to show up, that is the biggest red flag. And I'll tell you, there's players on this team that have been dealing with this for their entire careers. And it's taken this long for them to get to the point where they stand up and say, I'm not doing this anymore. And I hope for other players that one, they don't have to deal with this, but two, if they do, they feel the inspiration to speak up sooner because no one should have to go through 12, 15 years of their national team careers and deal with systemic mistreatment. I hope that this fight inspires those players to speak up for what they deserve and to not play if that's what it takes because the truth comes comes out um, you know, when players speak up and when players decide to, to, to like Bethany said, um, find their empowerment together. Janine, it has been genuinely an honour to be with you. All of us at MIB are sending you and your Canadian teammates all of our support, wishes for strength. It's 2023. You will win this fight. Well, I just can't thank you enough for having me on, Raj. I, again, I've been such an admirer of the show from afar um, and everything that you do for the game. Um, so I'm genuinely so appreciative of the time and, and you having me on to tell our story. And, um, you know, I hope this this is definitely not our last conversation. So thank you so much. I will have you on any time, Janine Becky. But please, God, when we next talk, we'll be able to talk about the thing we both love, which is the football. But to all of you, oh, we wish you strength. Thank you so much. Courage. <laughs>